Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. I'm James. And I'm Scott. And we are three industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Woo. That's right. And we are excited to have a seasoned industrial designer with us today. Scott Henderson has worked at Teague. He was the VP of ID at Smart Design. You've also worked on your own products, selling them around the world and in places like the MoMA store. And you founded your own studio and have designed everything from furniture to medical devices to housewares. And I even read to aircraft. And I I don't know what that is, but I'm excited to get into that. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, Scott, thanks for coming in today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you rode here on your bike. Your studio's in Dumbo, Brooklyn. Yeah, Dumbo, 45 Main. And uh, yeah, we're excited to get into your story. I think we usually like to talk a little bit about kind of your backstory. You know, how did you uh, discover industrial design? What was your childhood like that kind of drove you into the field? Yeah, well, I was always into art. You know, I was always drawing, sketching, painting uh, ever since I was, you know, small kid. And I actually thought I wanted to be a painter or a sculptor or some sort of fine artist. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I went through high school, basically very immersed in all kinds of art, you know, work. And I decided to uh, go to art school after high school. So I looked at all the schools, looked at Pratt, looked at RISD, looked at, all, looked at everything, and I wound up at the University of the Arts down in Philadelphia. Did you grow up in New England area? Or? No, I grew up uh, like an hour away from New York City, okay. up in uh, Westchester County. Okay. Nice. Uh, yeah, so I went to the University of the Arts, which, you know, at the time when I went there, it was called the Philadelphia College of Art and Design. Okay. And my last year there, I guess, uh, they changed the name to the University of the Arts, which is what everybody knows of it now. Um, and while there, you know, it was a typical art school uh, where... They followed the uh, Bauhaus, you know, where there was like Mm. the foundation year. Right. And, you know, you get exposed to all kinds of different disciplines in the arts. And through that, you know, I discovered industrial design and I started hanging around in the industrial design department and, you know, learning about it, you know, even as a freshman. And, uh, you know, I got into it because it combined a lot of the things that I was into, you know, like one of the big drivers for me always growing up was um just being really into visuals like making cool visuals like that's Mm. why i was into painting i wanted to make like a cool painting that was like visually impactful right were were you doing more like abstract painting or landscape painting was it just every kind of painting What, what kind of stuff did you gravitate towards well, when I was a little kid, like when I was like a high school kid, I was into like fantasy art, like Frank Frazetta. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I feel like James was into like the comic book stuff. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I was like really into Frank Frazetta, who, who's a Brooklyn guy. Um, and, you know, I just thought like, you know, okay, you know, it's, it's cool to depict this stuff so realistically. I respected the skill, but there was just something about these pieces of art that were like really powerful, you mm. know, the way, the way they were done. So, you know, I, I was into that. And so at art school, you know, like uh, industrial design combined the opportunity to do a lot of that, but then uh, put it three, use a lot of three dimensional skills as well. Um, and I thought it was cool early on that by applying like a good thought or some thinking to something that has function. Um, automatically gives it this higher impact because it's usable. It's something right. that anybody can use. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I just majored in ID. <laughs> yeah. So there was no, was there any like tinkering that you were doing before you got into industrial design, like while you were growing up? I mean, I feel like you hear a lot of stories about people 
wanting to take things apart. Taking the toaster apart? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, no, not really. I was, I was more into, um, this is comforting to hear because that's not my story either. Yeah. (laughs) No, I was more into the driver for me was like, uh, doing something that would create like a wow, you know, something visual, something with the arts that would have it the, effect of giving other people like a wow like yeah look at that that's awesome yeah i remember seeing on your instagram you posted recently i think it was something that you did in college which was this lamp that that was coming out of an eggshell yeah actually that was my first job out of college okay cool (laughs) but it looks like a college project that's super impactful yeah you know how did how did that how did you come to this concept well I was lucky enough to work at this design studio. My first job out of school, it was called Sonneman Design Group. Mm. Um, you know, and it's still they're, they're still making lights. You know, they still they make a lot of you know lights, lighting design. Yeah, and they show at ICFF. They're still they're still very busy, um, winning awards. I think I saw them win, win a bunch of awards. But anyway, so that was my first job, and uh, the brief usually was just desk lamp wall lamp yeah chandelier just like one word just just do a desk lamp (laughs) you know we had we had some clients and then we would do a lot of work with this uh company george kovacs Mm. this guy george kovacs and so i had the freedom to basically do a lot of experiments with forms and for making lights and lamps and uh so that came about uh i this was before cad yeah <laughs> you know like they had some cat around but it wasn't really useful right. you know and uh so i took some weather balloons and i blew them up and i mixed up a bunch of plaster in like a bucket and i i got it into the weather balloon well first i dumped it into the weather balloon without the air in the weather balloon and then i blew up the weather balloon uh-huh. and then i swirled it around like slip cast it yeah and you know basically let it sit there overnight as a shell and then basically by popping that weather balloon it destroyed everything that was inside of it but it left me with that shit so basically that shell there is exactly what was left yeah. out of out of this experiment yeah so i just uh stuck a light out in the middle of it <laughs> that's interesting. you know and took a photo of it because it's like you know it's cool looking and um yeah like right before that um like when i was still in uh well, actually, a few years before that, I did this painting of uh, the Salvador Dali painting. I was just trying to like copy it for right. to, to build skill level, right. you know. And it was called um, "Geopoliticus Child Witnessing the Birth of a New Man." And uh, so that is kind of the inspiration that is why i thought of okay doing it i was about to say i was like why were you pouring plaster in a weather balloon like it was interesting <laughs> well no i was i was attempting to come up with some cool shade sh- right. shapes right but the reason that i took that picture and did that composition with that light is because i was referencing this salvador dolly thing yeah um you know so you can see it see the see the cloud above it with all the broken edges and then there's like something coming out of like an egg shape right yeah all the references are there you know so So. would you say that like you started out with an appreciation for art and then moved into industrial design would that be fair to say or yeah and i would say that i still am bent that way you know like uh i think like i try to pack into my industrial design um levels of meaning that go beyond just sheer form follows function right like emotional layers right i call them you know yeah and so was that was that something that you went into college with like you know or was the was college where that all matured and kind of like well i just had this sort of deep appreciation for the arts in general you know yeah so like you know some industrial designers aren't like that you know they're they separate themselves from you know the art the right they don't want to be called artists you know and um you know i look at all all art 
you know, as one big thing, the creative process, a way to apply the creative process, you know? Yeah. So like even mu like music, fine art, you know, whatever, whatever it is, writing, you know, creative writing, industrial design, it's all the same. Yeah. To me, it's all the same. Yeah. <clears throat> to kind of uh, go back to the, like, or maybe close out the college chapter, was there anything that was very like an impactful moment when you were in college learning industrial design or an impactful person or um hmm. yeah well we had great instructors and uh um you know i'll tell you what it was it was right around the time when frog design mm. was uh buying the back cover of this magazine called ID, which is no longer around. Right. And a lot of people might not remember it, but uh, it was a victim of like the, the folding of every printed publication. Right. You know? Right. right. Um, but yeah, I was, I met Herbie Pfeiffer who was working there and uh, we were talking about uh how important photography is mm, yeah you know and i don't know if you remember like the uh back covers of id magazine you know with frog design what mm. they did with that but they were the groundbreakers really yeah for uh glorifying industrial design they were like really the first ones to do like amazing studio photography yeah uh, that was that. yeah they were they were the ones and so i was like hooked on that like ooh, look at how impactful industrial design can be if it's presented the right way right yes. and also another thing that they taught me uh they came to the school i don't know herb pfeiffer and maybe another couple frog people yeah um this was like the, the heyday of frog with Harmon and esslinger running everything um and yeah what were they saying they were um Oh, they taught me something about process, which I still like really latch on to. Um, so a lot of designers show like zillion sketches yeah. to the client and right. almost let the client pick one. Yeah. yeah. And really let the client drive it because they're showing so much. But Frog didn't do that. They were like, we're going to show you two, yeah. you know, or one. Yeah. And, and we're going to show it at the level of a, an appearance model and you haven't even seen it yet right so you know so they would just bring in a physical model yeah to the meetings it never this client never saw a sketch yeah. never saw anything it just here's the physical model yeah wow yeah I and mean, they I, were pioneers in that so like they were pioneers in that they were one of the first shops to have uh, first ID studios to have a big shop with with milling machines mm. and all that stuff they were really like before that. So this is like, we're talking like 1990. Yeah. You know? Before that, uh, I would say, you know, people didn't go to that extreme right. yet. And now it's commonplace, you know, like, you know, some of these big studios have really impressive state of the art, everything, you know, every, every kind of rapid prototyping in house. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so they taught me a lot about process. So I do that too, you know, like I, I will present things at a pretty high level to the client with a strong recommendation and say, look, I really like this. I may have done 20 concepts, but I'm not going to show you them. Right. I'm going to show you like the best two. Exactly. You know? Yeah, That's awesome. I, I feel like I see a lot of the uh, the frog work for Apple, like all that, all those prototypes, kind of like litter my Pinterest feed. Mm. Like oh, the, you, the Snow White, yeah, Snow White area, yeah. And then there's that the the Sony TV, and then of course that motorcycle. That yeah, it's just oh, I don't amazing. Think I've seen the motorcycle. You haven't seen the motorcycle? <laughs> Come on, I'll have to check it, it out. It, but yeah. Um, no, that's that's awesome, Scott. And you went to work for this lighting studio after you graduated. Yeah. Um, well, it's like an industrial design studio. Okay. That did a that lot of lighting. focused on a lot of lighting. And okay. they also did some housewares. So this guy, Robert, um, sort of uh, acquired another studio called the Monty Lebanon Associates. Mm. Associates. And um, Monty was in the same ilk, same years... Uh, same time frame as Henry Dreyfus, mm. and, like the man, yeah. and Walter Dormantique. So this was 1990, and I was 
he was at that time like 78. So you, so he actually was like, you know, um, uh, colleagues with like the Dr- Henry Dreyfus and Walter Dormitigue and, and, um, you know, uh, people like that. And, uh, so he had housewares clients. And so I got a, my first job, I was starting to do housewares too. So I would sort of fluctuate in between lighting and, you know, designing things for like Sunbeam or whoever. So, yeah. and this was, this was still at the same studio. You yeah. Weren't, you weren't like, so there was the same studio, but these two guys had like different factions of the business going at the same time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then, you know, I guess anything, uh, any, anything stand out from that time in your career? I mean, this was early foundational career years. Yeah. I mean, I was just like really into it. You know, I would, uh, you know, I started to realize how, th- how I wanted to work three dimensionally. So at first I was, uh, doing a lot of sketches and, uh, I was like, oh man, you know, this doesn't, this is a lot of painful work, you know? Yeah. And then I started uh, just making models out of paper with hot glue. Yeah. And we had this big wall, you know, by this conference table. And I would just start gluing stuff to the wall. I mean, you know, I would trash the wall. <laughs> and uh, the office, yeah, they didn't really care. Like, we, I, we would just like paint it every, you know, once in a while. But it was yeah. cool to have these things like stuck on the wall because, you know, they were. They were wall lights. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely admire the whole hands-on thing. I'm a big hands-on guy myself. I yeah. enjoy doing the cardboard, the paper. Are you, do you tend to find yourself doing more of the the hands-on kind of building? Yeah. Well, now, so yeah, I was like super 3D guy. Right. You know, at Smart Design too. You know, they they would call me like the king of foam. I would walk around like a snowman, <laughs> you know, with foam all over me. Yeah, oh, man. Uh, but then, you know, I just started getting like a little bit sick from it. You know, like uh, right. all that dust. Yeah. And I, you know, also at Teague, I was at Teague before the smart design days, and they were early adopters with the whole three D CAD thing. Mm. You know. And uh, so I became pretty good with that, you know, like I learned, you know, the 3D CAD stuff like really early, you know, like a lot of people weren't really doing it yet. Yeah. Like when I first came to Smart, they didn't have any of that going yet. Right. Um, so did you, did you bring that to Smart or? Well, you know, I was like one of the champions, like we better get on this because yeah. like this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, Why was Teague such an early adopter? Because, because of, of the, the aircraft. Yeah. Because of the aircraft stuff. Yeah, that's why. You know, Teague had Boeing. Yeah. And we worked on Gulfstream. And, you know, all of that was aircraft. I mean, all of that was 3D CAD, like Katia. Yeah. You know, um, you had to. You had to have that, that BIM. You know, you had to be able to um, cat- catalog all these parts. Yeah. You know, it's too complicated otherwise. Right. You know, so so you went from the lighting studio to work for Teague, yeah. And this was Teague in Seattle, is that correct? No, or they had a New York office. They had a New York office. The okay. original office was New York. Okay. Uh, so you could say I was like do in the original have, office. They still have an office here? No, they don't. Okay, that's why I'm confused. Yeah. Got it. Um, that's uh, that's awesome. I mean, you worked at you worked on aircraft design. Yeah. How does that work? Because in my mind. You can't just add some sort of fun aesthetic element to an aircraft because it's well, yeah, very... yeah, but you can. I mean, you know, so like, well, at Teague we were doing interiors. Oh, okay, okay. You know, so it's like designing the inside of a camper, right? Except right. nice, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And there's a lot of like, you know, constraints. Like there's this domed headline. You know, mm-hmm. there's all this FAA, right? You know, uh, stuff that goes into designing like the inside of an airplane. Um, but and then I also got to do some exterior paint schemes, so like actually like suggesting what they're going to paint the exterior fuselage like. Yeah, nice. and actually they painted. So we made this giant full scale model of a Gulfstream G5. So I worked on the Gulfstream G5, which was the uh, first uh, Gulfstream that could go from New York City to Tokyo without yeah. without refueling. Where did you find room to do that in New York City? No, we made the model in Texas. <laughs> okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so we we just went back. We went to this place in Texas, and like you know, we had a shop there doing it. Yeah, but we were designing it. Me yeah, and this yeah, team yeah. of people, you know, not just me. Um, 
Yeah, but so like I designed this exterior paint scheme, which they actually painted onto this like full scale, full scale model of this Gulfstream G5, which was humongous. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I need to I need to look up a Gulfstream G5. Yeah. Was it? Did you put the uh, kind of the shark mouth on it in the flames? Yeah. <laughs> well, it had yeah it had some you know contour lines, and but then I designed this. Uh, my paint scheme is not around now anymore, um, but it had this five, uh, like a Roman numeral five, yeah. like on this little block. You know, it was pretty stylized. And then the uh, these lines that were on the fuselage kind of dove into this five that was on the block. You know, so it was like all tied together. Cool. Yeah. You know, that's kind of uh, fun. Yeah. Is the is the interior here? Is that anything that you worked on, or is that more? Is that newer? It could be. They could even still be using like the tables that I did. Right. I don't right. even know. But um, that's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. It was a cool experience because you know we get to go to the. Uh, it was called the National Business Aircraft Association trade show. Mm-hmm. So like it's like picture the Javits Center with all kinds of aircraft in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like you know the real real so like. I was there on setup day because we had this model that we did. Yeah. Uh, and like they're landing helicopters down out of, in, outside of the loading dock and just wheeling them in. <laughs> That's crazy. I wouldn't expect anything <laughs> less from an aircraft show. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And then I also worked on some aircraft like more recently um, just supporting a contractor that was trying to get or gets business from, you know, doing all kinds of like big unmanned aerial vehicles and stuff like that yeah so a designer like me can come on board and help them like with the pitch deck right like uh you know make cool visuals of the stuff right so you know like i don't know how to make something fly per se but i can make it look like it does (laughs) (laughs) you can make it fly off the page (laughs) the the magic exactly yeah (laughs) oh man that's that's amazing. So when you were doing CAD for that kind of stuff, was that CAD of the interior, or yeah, yeah, like the seats and things seats, like that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We would go to this shop called KC Aviation, which uh, is near like Love Field and like Washington. You know, they make there's like there's these big companies that specialize in you know creating these like prototypes for aircraft seats and right. you know, all that. I'm sure. Yeah, I bet it's a huge industry. Now, yeah, it's, it is, what was CAD? What was CAD like back then? I mean, like when you're working in CAD now, does the speed just like blow you away? Like, was this? What was the speed like? Because I have to imagine that it was very difficult to work fast in CAD at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I started getting really good with CAD. I would say like many years after I was first exposed to it. Right. For sure. Like when I first started using it, it was, it's really interesting actually, because when CAD first came around, you could only run it on these Unix workstations. Yeah. And they cost like $80,000 for like one machine. <laughs> yeah. 80000 Yeah. Something crazy what? like that. Yeah. For yeah. 60000 for one computer. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah, and that, that's not even to mention the software, the license. Yeah, so uh, did it come with a built-in seat? I I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where seats of CAD come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they were so it was so the barrier to entry for a design firm to have it meant it was like a dedicated seat. Like yeah. you know, it was like a little. A little command center there that you can't mess with. Yeah, yeah. That's I imagine as complex as a as a like an airplane's control room. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. I don't, no. I don't think that's no. No. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but these like uh, I forget the company that made these workstations, but you know, like uh, Lunar did one that was like an award winner. I don't know. They were they were yeah. cool. They were like purple. Yeah. The housings were purple. Yeah. Okay. What, what was the name of those stations again? <sighs> Was the name Unix. Of there were Something. Unix. Unix was the operating system. It didn't even run on like operating systems that were common. Right. Yeah. Um, well. Yeah. That's all right. Well, I'll think of it later. Yeah. 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 Um, but then, so you were at Teague for what? Two years? Three. Three years. I want to say three. Yeah. And then, how did you? 
how did you go from there? What was the process of going there to, to smart design? Uh, well, Teague was going to shut down the New York office. So uh, yeah. I think we had the choice of maybe moving out to Seattle. But I, I was going to... Um, going to stick around New York so um, yeah I just started interviewing around and I called up smart design and went in there and had like some grueling interviews you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah I don't know somehow I got hired <laughs> what? <laughs> what? How does that? What? what? Wait, there, so there, what? What constitutes? For, well, first of all, we have so many students listening to this podcast, being like, "How in the world?" Yeah, <laughs> huh? it mean, was early in the smart days too. Yeah. You know, like I don't know, there were like five partners or something, and uh, only like uh, ten employees or something. Right. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so what was yeah. what was particularly grueling about the interview? Oh, I, I just remember Tucker of Emeister was like, we can't hire this guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, we're, we're like, we're like good friends nowadays, you know. He's like, he's like, we can't hire him, yeah. Um, Why not? I don't know. Well, I think it worked out. Like, I think like after I was hired and I was working there, um, you know, everybody was happy. But um, yeah, I mean. It's I think it's because I was like a senior level person. Like usually the people that were applying there were pretty much younger than me. Uh, like I had a lot of experience already. Like I had already worked at that lighting company for two. I had like six, five, six years of experience already. Right. You know, so I was going to come in as like a senior designer. And, you know, I just think, you know, I was like, uh, besides the people that were partners there, one of the more senior level right you know, people as far as experience goes yeah so that's probably the hesitation you know of like you know a bigger step than just hiring somebody that's brand new out of school gotcha you know? and you you started as like a, a the vp of industrial design or did you work your way up to that no or? i was a senior designer was okay. my starting level i think yeah what kind of projects did you work on at smart um, what was some memorable ones Oh, the most memorable ones were, well, I worked on OXO when OXO was still owned by the founder, this okay. guy, Sam Farber, mm -hmm. uh, who's like, you know, a legendary entrepreneur, you know, yeah. um, started OXO, started Copco, um, started, uh, this thing called Wovo, which I worked on too, um, yeah, so like that dustpan there and some other cleaning products were, only like the sixth or seventh products that OXO ever made. Wow. You know, period. Yeah. Like they, they really only had their first original line, which was kitchen gadgets, and there was only five. So I might have worked on like maybe the sixth product yeah. ever Did, in the history. Okay, so they had already designed the peeler before you got there? Yeah, or? before I got there, the peeler was already there. But it was just like going through the getting gold awards and things. Right. Like it, it's brand new. So no one really like knew it happened the like impact. the year before. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. 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 That's amazing. And I mean, this is such an iconic product in, in the history of industrial design. Could you tell us a little bit about this dustpan right here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was really cool working with Sam Farber and his wife was involved too. They were like, uh, like a team almost because you know the the um reason that oxo uh came about was because his wife had arthritis you right know? and using like that cheap um potato peeler that was made out of steel is like hard to do if right. your yeah. hand is hurting you yeah uh so they made these like thick uh you know handled potato peelers and it was it was cool because uh, it was really visionary, like extremely visionary, um, because all these potato peelers only cost like 75 cents. Right. You know? And the mentality in housewares or any kind of design back then was that to make a better, um, to make a competitive one has to cost 74 cents. Right. <laughs> right. And, and so like the OXO one costs like eight bucks. Yeah. And uh, everybody said to them, you're nuts. This is not going to work. It's not going to succeed. Yeah. You yeah. Know? That's crazy. And it did. You know, it succeeded. 
So it's like it's exactly the same. Like I don't know if you know like the you know like the Bugaboo stroller. You know the Bugaboo. Is that it? Uh, for 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 babies. Okay. No, I'm not familiar. Well, bugaboo the stroller. Bugaboo stroller is the same kind of idea. Like before the Bugaboo, which costs like a thousand dollars or eleven hundred dollars. These strollers, the competitive strollers, cost like maybe the highest end one out there was three hundred dollars. Yeah. So people are like, you know, you're you're quadrupling the price of these things. Yeah. It's not gonna work, and it works because yeah. like design, you know, uh, made the value that much better. Right. Um, oh, I, I love I love those untapped markets like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Was that did that? But change? I didn't work on the. I, I that's not. I didn't work on the Bugaboo. I'm just no, using no, it as no. an example. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did that did that change your mindset when it came to industrial design like was that you know yeah i just thought wow this is cool you know like we're really doing some you know i thought wow we're doing some really um you know exciting work that's going to change industries and everything you right know? uh so yeah i was uh pretty jazzed up about it yeah so I mean, I can imagine like once once the peeler is is like proven a success, then it's just like okay, well the door is wide open to <laughs> redesign literally everything. Yeah. Because at that point, I would imagine that most of the stuff out there was just like cheap and you know didn't really have any infusion of ergonomics or design. Yeah, it didn't. You know, and so like smart design was a perfect place for me too because. Uh, you know, I said to you, I said before, like when I was at uh, the lighting Sonneman place, um, I was very 3D and I was gluing stuff on the walls. Yeah. And that's exactly what we were doing at Smart, you know? Yeah. Like we were cutting foam, we were making mock ups, we were testing. So, like in phase one, and I thought it was really cool, I thought it was really cool that in presentation meetings, we would show these like hacked up foam models as con we would yeah. present them. Oh, <laughs> so this is this is a little co uh, contrast to the frog story because frog story was pretty. Yeah, much it is contrasted to the frog story. Oh, yeah, yeah, but it was presenting models instead of sketches. Yeah, which uh, I thought was cool because you know it's hard. You everybody can see what the idea is because you know a three dimensional object doesn't hide anything right right um and you know you know sometimes the models were were amazing looking too yeah just dependent on like you know how much work you were putting into right, it right right or how much time you had yeah no and this was with all clients or was For this a lot of clients yeah. yeah we would do like 3d stuff definitely and yeah. would the would the clients get excited by this like was it something a yeah. change of pace for them I thought that it pushed the process along faster mm. and it was less toilsome. Right. You know, because you would, um, you know, you would, you would see the idea quicker yourself. You right. Know? And you weren't struggling as much, you know, with like yeah. that designer hell where you're trying to come up with the idea. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. You know, and it's because the information is not there, you know, like, but if you're, forced to make a three-dimensional representation of it yeah you know you solve a lot of issues pretty quick uh, yeah i mean i can imagine even on like this dustpan i don't know if you did models for that or or what yeah. but if it was just a photo and you showed it to the or a rendering and you showed it to the client maybe the client would have concerns over like ergonomics or things like that and not even pick the design they will maybe like yeah well, actually being able to hold on to the handle yeah. has so much more value so like What's interesting too about the dustpan and this cleaning line, you know, which was the, the project that I was asked to do really, um, is that it it has a different handle than the other, the first stuff with the fins. Right. And I guess our logic was, um, you know, let's not overdo that handle or that handle is not appropriate for everything, you know, so like what's the next handle? Yeah. You know. And so, like, a lot of little egg handles started coming out. Like, there's, like, a sister product to the dustpan, like a squeegee. Yeah. And, like, a little scrub brush. And they have these egg handles. So this idea of this egg, you know, which um, is, like, a really great ergonomic shape, you know, is starting to be applied to a lot of OXO things. And it came out of, it definitely came out of, like, that dustpan or that squeegee because those are the first two yeah. where the egg, you know, emerge yeah cool. 
You know, it's funny. My my parents had one of these growing up, and I I remember thinking it was so cool the way that it hung up oh, because it, there's the suction cup that goes on to the wall, and I think that actually has the logo in it because the yeah. logo is kind of that elliptical shape, and then the way that it hangs up is it has a corresponding like cut on the squeegee, so you just push the logo. This is for the shower. This is for the shower. Okay. Uh, and I just, I remember as a kid thinking like, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The nice suction cup thing. Sure. Yeah. And then we did like a bunch of suction cup stuff later that, uh, was really successful in the design, you know, award programs, but I guess it didn't really sell as well. So that only lasted on the market for, you know, a couple of years, mm. but, uh, it was it was called the uh, Oxo suction cup bath line or something, but really cool forms. Um, yeah, but you know, so like the thing about working on that stuff after so soon after, yeah, there's there's that one. Yeah, I saw you posting. You posted this on your yeah on your Instagram recently. Yeah, so the cool thing about working on this stuff is that I was working with Sam Farber, who um, sold the whole program, you know, to uh, World Kitchen or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, even though he, you know, had done many companies, he wanted to do another one. So we started this new one called Wovo. And, uh, you know, I worked on all these Wovo things for him. You is, know, Is Wovo kitchenware as well, or is it? Different. No, it's like thick walled plastic bowls and uh, there's okay. there's one or two examples. Like like Tupperware kind of thing? No. So the whole okay. point of it was to make things out of yeah, scroll down. Yeah, there's one. Go up, go up. That. That Oh you know. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the idea was that plastic should not automatically um, be thought of as disposable or right. cheap. Right. If it can be elevated by design. Right. You know, so we made these like beautiful forms, you know, out of plastic and they had like long, you know, that was tricky, you know, to make them because they had, you know, they were thick walled, long cycle times, you know, we had to convince the people at the factory, this is what we want. We don't care if it takes 60 seconds to mold one, just mold it. Yeah. (laughs) Cause 'cause I'm sure, I'm sure with the thick plastic, you're looking at some sinking problems in the plastic. Yeah. So we had to have like vats of water outside of the injection molding machine that they would come down and, and bathe around in. So they wouldn't deform immediately. Yeah. Fixture. So it, you know, it's true, like best practice design for manufacturer where they tell you, you know, two and a half millimeter wall and, you know, all that's for a reason. So you don't have to make this expensive uh, way of making things like fixtures, you know, they had to take some of these and put them over like wooden fixtures to make sure they maintained their shape. Wow. You know, stuff that's like a, that. That's that's <laughs> some demanding design. But I think the the end result is really elegant. I mean, we're looking at these. Uh, two plastic carafts here and they're kind of this red one is translucent has a nice elegant form to it it's really it's really quite beautiful so did sam farber did he always have an appreciation for design or is that something that he cultivated in working with smart like or is that something that you helped him yeah well at first he did copco yeah which is still like a big company yeah owned by wilton you know industries um, so he founded Copco, you know, and then he sold it to Wilton. Yeah. Um, and he worked with Smart on it too. Yeah. And, and Copco is another what drink drinkware company? Is that correct? Uh, well, now they're known for tea kettles. Okay. You know, lots of tea kettles. Right. I remember these. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know where he got it from, but Copco is definitely design heavy. Also. Yeah. You know. Yeah, because uh, he's also from the Farberware family, right? Yeah, like, but I think it's like a distant cousin. Okay, it's, it's not really. Yeah. Gotcha. Is New York just like the the kitchen houseware hub? It might be. I don't know. Well, Chicago's where the show is. I I don't know. That's interesting. Is what? is the is the houseware hub of America? Is it New York City? I mean, there's so oh. many companies. Oxo. Well, you just we just named three. That yeah. Well, I think. 
you know, in terms of the world of industrial design, housewares tends to be, well, now I think it's a little different, but it used to be that housewares are like an East Coast thing. Mm. Okay. And computer stuff was like a West Coast right. thing. Right. Yeah, but now I think it's like all over the place. You know, you got all these great industrial design firms in the Midwest doing yeah. housewares and stuff. So Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, Scott, how did you go from being that senior designer to that VP of ID? I mean, VP of ID is a pretty uh, prominent position, yeah. especially at Smart Design. Uh, like longevity, I was there for like 12 years. Wow. You okay. know, and uh, did a ton of projects there. The reason I stayed there for a really long time was because the quality of the projects was great. Right. You know, I mean, I was doing, I was happy doing these projects. Um, yeah, and then I got to this point where, you know, my hands-on approach uh, was being challenged because I would have to, or was expected to be more of a manager, which you have to do. Right. As your firm gets bigger and bigger, you know, you have to at some point step away and start managing the process as opposed to doing it. Right. Right. And um, I didn't want to step away like that so um what i wound up doing i started this little venture called mint with uh alberto mantija and tony baxter and we had that going while i was at smart you know for like at least a few years and and mint is this houseware company that you you guys started you what kind of products did they we started it yeah so Alberta, that's not one of them. That's like more recent. Yeah. But this is still kind of in the houseware arena. But right? you can scroll down like... Uh, oh, this... The this piggy stuff. bank. Oh, yeah, the piggy bank. Uh, actually, go to the mortar and pestle. It's just a couple more oh, yeah. down, probably. Uh, yeah. And you started this while you were at Smart Design. Yeah, see that mortar and pestle there? Yeah. Yeah, so while we were at Smart Design, so... Curve ID is this design firm that was sharing space or had a space that was on the same floor as uh, as Smart Design, and this was in the very early days of rapid prototyping, where we had this like rapid prototyping machine in the office that uh, used like a flour, like a powder. Right. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Remember those? And um, so I made this. I was on my way out to work for Hewlett Packard. Like uh, we were doing Hewlett Packard projects and I had sketched on like it's cliche, like on a napkin, <laughs> that thing, that mortar and pestle. And I'm like, Ooh, you know, this would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is a good idea. Like I knew it was a good idea. Uh, so this is my earliest chance to do it. I uh, modeled it and, you know, in CAD and, and threw it into this like flower machine that we had this, 3d this crude 3d printer that we yeah. had and uh right around that exact time alberto was 3d printing his hug salt and pepper shakers oh yeah oh yeah the the, the those are those the are ghosts. pretty famous right yeah they're really famous um it's like the most knocked off product in uh in history yeah the salt and pepper shakers just the, the pepper and the salt are hugging yeah exactly so we had these two things and they kind of go together because they were like so my mortar and pestle follows this a theme of of like form that exists in a lot of things that i've done mm. where there's like two objects that work together as one right. statement yeah and so the hug salt and pepper is also like that you know right. it's like an interactive you know the two things mate on each other yeah so we're just looking at those and we're like hmm and yeah, maybe we should start a little design line you yeah. know uh -huh. and uh so we did you know and then we grew it to like I don't know, 14 products or something. Yeah. And the majority of them were sold in the MoMA store and all kinds of other, you know, like Guggenheim, um, yeah. San Francisco MoMA, yeah. Sempre in Tokyo, you know, like really great stores all over the whole world. And, uh, uh, you know, so yeah, it was great. And like, you know, before like the big crash of 2008, you know, right. it, was, it, was, it was a flourishing, like amazing business. Yeah. It was this all did you ever jump in full time on on this brand or was this all it was always on the, on the side but so like when this was going on all of a sudden i decided look i'm gonna step i'm gonna leave smart design you know and start my own firm right so um because i had 
I was too distracted, you know, and I didn't, you know, Smart was like doing great and uh, the demanding, they wanted me to be like this manager and I wanted to be this hands-on designer, you yeah. know, and work on a smaller level. Yeah. You know, I was always frustrated to have to go to meetings and sit in meetings for like hours. Right. Right. Uh, so I split and I started my own company, you know, uh, my own little design firm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. Now, how did you, how did you go about starting the relationships with, with like the MoMA store and all these retailers? Through Sam, through Sam Farber. Okay. So like he introduced, well, we would have buyer meetings and he was a cool guy. Like he would bring, you know, I would meet the buyers. Yeah. Like I was like exposed to who all these people are. Right. And uh, I just kept their contact information. You know, I just kept up the relationships with them. Yeah. You know, so then when it was time to show them something, you know, at least you know who they are and they know who you are. Right. So you can say, look, I got something I'd like to show you. Can I stop over yeah. and show it to you? Yeah. You know? That's uh, interesting. Yeah. And you, you, you guys obviously manufactured these overseas or China, Yeah, China, okay. Thailand, exactly. And did you actually go and visit the, fa the factories and work with the factories? And yeah. I, I mean, that, that's a whole job in of, uh, in of itself is like sourcing and manufacturing. Yeah. I mean, how much of that did you well, work on? Well, the one company that we that makes like the hug salt and pepper shakers and stuff, Yeah. Um, we found through just Thomas's register. Do you know what that is? Yeah, that's that's a it's like Alibaba, but I think it's for US. It's like right? the original Alibaba. Oh. Yeah. They used to, you know, like this was like a long time ago, you know, but it used to be the way that you would do this. Yeah. You know, they would have these books like encyclopedias, and anything you wanted to make, you know, they were all listed in this Thomas Register. Wait, and, it was a book? Yeah, it was books. Oh, I mean, I know the website. I didn't know it was a book. So it's like a phone book of factories. Yeah, but it was no, it's like. A set of encyclopedias. <laughs> <laughs> so twenty phone books. Yeah, like twenty phone books. Okay. okay. Yeah, and every every design office had them. Wow. Yeah, and so I found this company that made the the hugs through the Thomas Register, and and then since then I found some people in China that also that made a few of the other pieces, you know, like agents and things. Right. You know. Okay, so you kind of worked through other people to get it all manufactured over there yeah like i met some agents through my my work with uh smart design you know like i've been to china like six seven times yeah and you know you, you're always a company escorted around by these agents right and uh you know you just get to know everybody there um so yeah and then it's like anything you just say here's a here's a project i want to do give me a quote you know right? yeah um could we rewind just a little bit to to the smart design to close out that chapter you know again like is there was there something very impactful and impactful obviously your relationship with sam farber seems to have been pretty impactful but yeah you know anything anything big come out of that um, time i don't know i i just felt like i was honing skills getting better and better at yeah. what i was doing there you know the projects were uh good you know they were uh the kind of stuff i like to do you know real nuts and bolts industrial design you know um so you know and we had these teams you know so we were multidisciplined, so we could do anything we right. could do you know we were starting to get into like interface stuff and you know we did i had all the branding stuff down with all that all those people doing that kind of stuff so um yeah it was a, it was a good experience but you know I got to the point where I felt like I had everything I needed myself right. to go and start a little right. studio. Yeah. And so I was like, I could just go and start in my own little studio and try that. You yeah. Know? And so that's what I did. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so coming into your new studio, how have the projects been and have you, and now that you're just uh, alone, have you been working with other contractors to kind of help with some of the work or are you taking on very specific projects yeah like i have like a little core group of freelance people right. that'll help me out you know uh or an intern will come in mm -hmm. for a few weeks in the summer or something um yeah and it's a lot of the same kind of projects that okay. i was doing so you outsourced. still you still held on to a lot of those connections well, no, a lot of the clients are all new, okay. but it's similar type of stuff, ah, right, houseware right, right. stuff, okay. you know, 
um, you know, electronics. Yeah. yeah. So and like, oh, another another thing. Uh, well, you guys know about this because you're you have impressive Instagrams and so on. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that I was really into was promoting whatever it is I was doing. Like, right. So I would definitely enter in, enter all the awards programs. Okay. I'd definitely have my ear to the ground as far as who was writing books about design. Mm. You know, and um, it made a huge difference and that was another thing that i kind of picked up off a of frog you know like the idea of promoting right. right um yeah so like i remember i heard about this book young american designers getting published mm. and uh i submitted my work you know through a bunch of work at that yeah and it all got in there you know that's amazing and from that i got some european because it was it was targeting the European audience, like, here's what's going on in America. Yeah. So, like, I picked up a client uh, in France that I've been working with for the last, like, 15 years now. Wow. From that book. I even, I think I saw, did you do something for Alessi as well? Yeah. Well, the thing I did for Alessi was never mass produced, but um, I, they liked it enough to put it in, in they have this museum. Yeah. So, it's in their, like, permanent collection. Oh, Is it wow. this bowl? Is yeah, it? it's called like the Spider Bowl. Yeah. Now to clarify, you said you said new studio. This studio, you've you've had the studio since two thousand three. Yeah. Yeah. So you or you, four. Yeah. Uh, so you left you left Smart Design in two thousand four, and yeah. yeah. So you were doing. Looks like you were still kind of doing Mint along with your own studio. Yeah, for I had a the while. two businesses going simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. And then Tony and Alberto had two businesses going too. They had their own id studio plus mint okay yeah, yeah so we were both like doing it as a side gig yeah um and now you've worked with skip hop as well yeah and i think there's this uh the um we we talked about it on the pot one of the podcasts past podcasts but i think it'd be great to talk about it again right uh you did a whale for the bathtub yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that project yeah well, i'll tell you about working with skip hop yeah um yeah, I started working with Skip Hop uh, in 2004, um, and it was just like a like a husband and wife team, and they were making soft goods like cut and sew. Okay, it was all they had made, all they were making, but they were their cut and sew bags were like market leaders. And this yeah. was this is for baby products or what is the what baby? The, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So they had like this. Uh, cut and sew diaper bags and changing pads and things. Um, and they uh, had a point of view that was kind of urban, like mm. for, like a hip kind of fashion-y. Right. Like so, so in a way, they were really pioneers because they were taking what this market that, you know, was usually like pastels and things that looked like they were designed for the, from the baby's point of view. And their idea was make it designed for the mother's point of view right. or oh, the father, yeah. you know, or the dad's point of view. Yeah. So it was like the first, I would say it's the first baby line to be designed for the, with the parent's point of view, you know? And, uh, so they wanted to do, they were having great success with all this stuff and they wanted to do hard goods, you know, like plastic stuff, right. yeah. accessories. So they interviewed a few design firms. And I, I remember it was just me, you know, like I had my little studio and I was the only one in the studio. And they were looking at like bigger firms too. Right. But I got the job. So <laughs> nice, <laughs> then, nice. Yeah. So uh, uh, was, yeah. That, was that based on how did they make their decision uh, like to go with you over you know was it i don't know maybe they just thought i would be easy to work with you know and yeah like, they're really getting like me you know instead of like a bigger because uh, i was really accessible you know like to work with them directly you know like really flush things out yeah um yeah so we did like five initial products and they were all really big hits like they were really successful a lot of them you know yeah really big in the press like a lot of attention thrown at them you know the splash bottle dryer was uh one like idsa awards and was mentioned in like 
Fortune magazine and Ink magazine as like this groundbreaking thing. Did, did you send this design to all these places? I mean, I know you just mentioned you you shot out all these. I definitely concepts. entered it in the IDSA's okay. awards, um, but no, it was picked up by like Ink magazine and pl- things like that just because it was successful out there right. in the yeah. market. You know, yeah. So that's like a cool design. You know, like I was thinking to myself, like I went out into the market and. Uh, I bought all the bottle dryers and tested them, and uh, I realized that uh, they were made out of the cheapest possible crap plastic that you could possibly mold anything out of. Right. This general purpose styrene, it's called. It's like white, cheap plastic, and uh, it has this like tinny, crappy feel when you touch it. And uh, none of them had a brush. None of them came with a brush. Hmm. Um, so, and they were all big and rectilinear and, you know, so new parents, like they need these bottle dryers cause they don't want to put these bottles in the dishwasher cause there's chemicals and, right. you know, so ha- new parents like hand wash things is what they do. So this is the product. There's a need, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah. So I realized like I could make it round. That was my first thought was like round, make it round, you know, cause there's no round ones. And then I thought, none of them come with a brush, so what if I integrate a brush somehow? And I immediately thought of, oh, putting it in the center, you know. And then I thought, ooh, it could look like a splash, like like a droplet of milk caught in stop-motion photography. Yeah. yeah. You know? And, uh, and then, like, the cool thing about it is the execution. So it's like, um, it's like these egg shapes that have just been trimmed, you know? Another egg shape. Uh-oh. Yeah. See all the egg shapes? But yeah. they're just, like, trimmed. So, like, the idea is, like, it didn't take very long to model this in CAD because it's all these revolves with, like, simple trims. Right. You know? Um, yeah, and it just came together and it's like a home run. You know? Right. Super impactful, and I imagine something that literally did make a splash within that industry. <laughs> yeah, it did. It's, it I mean, I couldn't help it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and Splash is a great name, you know. And so that's another thing. Like, I was, like, naming these things, like, coming up with names. Right. Yeah. So it was all part of, like, the presentation of, you know, making it exciting. Like, yeah. you know, even my concepts had little names on them, you know. Right. Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of times the sorts of presentations that I've, I've sort of been a part of or seen it's like there's this encouragement on just like all right just list out the functions or you know just like make it function driven that you like crossed out all these things but it's like to present something like this is is a completely different yeah mindset yeah so like I'll talk about how it has an extra layer of meaning like an emotional layer yeah so it does all these functional things it's a lazy susan it spins around you know you you can select you know go to the back by spinning it it holds the brush in the center integrated uh you know space efficiencies all these things and yet it has this extra layer of emotional content in that it looks like a splash that's been caught on camera yeah and uh so it doesn't stop at utility it goes that extra level to give people something to talk about editors something to write about right you know there's a story yeah i i love that because you also have it on your website that you believe that if something makes you smile, it becomes easier to use. Yeah. That's a good little quote. Right <laughs> yeah. When did you come up with that idea? I, I came up with that um, a really long time ago at Smart. Um, I don't know. It might have been that I was writing something uh, for IDSA or something yeah. like that. But because um, like over the years, I've submitted a lot of articles to IDSA, you know. Yeah. But uh, it was first like coined in print. Like GQ magazine came around and yeah. uh, did like a, a fashion story, and they, I was like the subject of it for like one. They did it. They did a bunch of designers. Yeah. Some dude from Frog. Some other. I don't know. There was a few. It was like a you know men's magazine. So it was all the, yeah. Uh, all of us, uh, you know, male industrial designers wearing like fancy clothes. <laughs> That's interesting. That's amazing. But uh, then there was the first time it was written in print. It was like, if something makes you smile, it becomes easier to use. Yeah. 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 That's that's cool. Um, And so, yeah, you also... So was the was Moby the the bathtub spout cover? Was that after Splash? Yeah, right after, though. And this this is like... That's like one of the best-selling baby products, you know. It's like 
I've, you know, in working in the baby industry, you know, you hear like people talk about products. Yeah. And it's definitely known as like a disruptor, you know? Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Like whenever you go into like, um, Bye Bye Baby. Yeah. The shelf where they sell them. It's always like torn to shreds. <laughs> <laughs> there might be like one like hanging there that's left. Oh, yeah, man. yeah. <laughs> no, I, th- I think I saw. I think I saw like a line out the block. People camping out for the newest shipment. <laughs> oh man! It's, I mean, it's, but I don't think there's like awesome. a new, I don't think there's a new parent in America that doesn't have it. No. Yeah. I we definitely we put it up on our Discord, and I think our resident parent Dave Joseph said he's got one. I think so. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's so amazing. Oh, and I'll tell you another really funny story about yeah. it. Yeah. So like two years ago, I went to Columbia, uh, Medellin, mm. um, to s- do a seminar, you know, like a design event that they were having at this university there. Yeah. And, uh, they didn't, they didn't, um, they weren't doing this because they knew I was coming. They just do this. Yeah. Um, they, as part of their CAD class. They had to. Mo- they have to model this. So every year, these kids have to model the Moby, oh, and it had wow. nothing to do with me going there. It was coincidence. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> that's really funny. Did, ha- did you get to see any of the three yeah. models? Did, yeah, I have did a people picture have of like it. really? I have a picture of this one kid, <laughs> which was like really great. <laughs> really great as in, <laughs> oh, as in like for like a whale that maybe needs. I don't know. It, yeah. Does he have a tail? Like yeah, and then so then they came up to New York. Um, they came up maybe before I went actually down there. That's how I met them and visited me in my studio at, uh, at 45 main. And, uh, I showed them the original, you know, I showed them my CAD model. Right. And they were, they, it was like, they were looking at, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like when you find the answers in the back of the book, it's like, oh, there's, it, there's the answer. <laughs> like the original. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Or like an early CAD, demo of like yesterday by the Beatles. And I'm sure their CAD model is like way better than mine. Cause mine, you know, is like a hack. I mean, like, you know, there's so many like patches and things on the mm. surfaces to get that form, you know, it was like pretty challenging, especially when you're creating it out of nothing. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so what was, what did, what was the prompt they came to you with? Yeah. So like all the, there were spout covers on the market, Yeah. but they all looked like literal ducks, you know, like they were oil painted, you know, they had colors, oh, yeah. they had like mm-hmm. orange beaks and, yeah. uh, and you know green bodies and uh, they look like literal ducks yeah little rubber duckies yeah and um so we wanted to do a whale so i sat down with partners there at skip hop and we wanted to do a whale so it was just like do a whale you know and um that was just like a gut like let's let's do a whale let's do a whale in the skip hoppy kind of point of view right you know and so like my spins on it were you know, how do you get it on and off the spout easy? So it's like this, it's almost like a glove. It's, it has no bottom, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's not fuzzy, fussy to get right. it on. You know, you just put it on. And uh, then the tail, it doubles as a hook. So my thinking there was like skip hop is sort of urbanish. That could mean a smaller apartment. Maybe there's not a, the master bath. Or right. maybe, maybe you have to take this thing off when, you know, ba- baby's not using it. Right. So where do you put it? So I put like this hook so you could hang it on like the shower rod or something, That's awesome. Yeah, you know, like ideas like that. And then like the little, um, fin, you know, you tighten it around the spout. So you pull his little fin and he tightens up. Uh, and then, you know, the diverter, you know, where you go and you make it from shower to tub, Yeah, you know, it has its little space on the blowhole area. Yeah. So, you know, like the whole thing is perfect. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was almost wondering yeah. if, if the whale idea came from the diverter because it kind of like would look like yeah. water coming out of the blowhole. It's just one of those happy, happy coincidences. Yeah. No, I, I think, yeah, I think we just targeted whale as opposed to duck. <laughs> um, so whale was the brief yeah yeah that's that's so cool yeah that's awesome it and i guess maybe to we, we might have to do two parts here um to wrap up this you know any i guess words of wisdom we have a lot of younger designers that listen to this podcast and you've had a pretty pretty long career any words of wisdom that you can um, maybe words of wisdom about you know going it on your own you know because that that's like 
that's the thing is like you you have this this rich history and then you went off on your own and you've achieved success yeah there let's see um let's see words of wisdom well one thing one thing i've had real success over is um understanding this like dfm you know world designed for manufacturing mm. like I would say like 90%, like a really high percentage of all the projects I've worked on have been mass produced. Right. You know, it's like a high percentage. Um, and I think it's just cause like I stay on it. Like I know what the pitfalls are going to be coming from, you know, after you hand it off to the factory or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I just think it's like important to, uh, you know, make sure that whatever you're putting out there, um, you know gets made you know yeah. so that there's a lot of stuff out there that uh you know you can uh fall back on and, and reference as giving you you know your your uh proof of you know worth in this competitive industry you know? right uh, yeah and w do you would you say that 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 knowledge came just with the amount of experience or is there a way that somebody can gain that knowledge faster um, yeah, I just think, you know, you should probably, you know, you want to, you, you just want to make sure you're covering all the details, you know, yeah. you're, you, instead of just stopping at concepts, Yeah. you know, um, yeah, just like the whale, a little blowhole detail. Yeah. <laughs> the tail. I love yeah. It. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, we might have to wrap this one up, uh, but we'll, uh, come back with a two parter, I believe. So, yeah. uh, hang tight and, um. Just to promote some of your work, Scott, your Instagram handle is at Scott underscore Henderson underscore Inc. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then, it's new too, so there's like nobody following it. Yeah, so go, guys, <laughs> you can be one of the first right now. Pull out your phones, can type we, it in. Can we promise them some sort of award for for being a new follower? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everyone gets a, a whale. Yeah. No, no. Um, um, and yeah, and then your your website is scotthendersoninc.com. So go check that out as well, and we'll we'll link to everything as well on our on our website. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, as always, I'm at Nick P. Baker. I'm at I Draw on Receipts, and I'm Scott Henderson. Peace out. <laughs> Later. <laughs>